So I'm really excited to have all of you here to have our speaker. You know, we try for this population opportunity to balance over the course of the year research and policy and practice and big picture, small picture, and every so often, like today, we get one person who kind of does all of that for us. And we're particularly appreciative because she's local right here in Florida. So it's a lesson that we don't always have to reach out far to find really important work that's happening right here. So with that, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Shreya Kangobi, who is an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania at that school down the street that some of you may have heard of, um, and executive director of the Penn Center for Community Health Workers. She led a multi-stakeholder team that des designed IMPACT, a model of care in which community health workers for high-risk patients to set and achieve health goals. Dr. Kangobi then founded the Penn Center for Community Health Workers to support first research development and implementation of evidence-based community health worker models. Yeah. And today we're going to hear from her about exactly that, community health workers from rhetoric to reality. of this conference for inviting me and to all of you who've actually made me feel so welcome even just in the short few minutes before this talk. This is a relatively small group. Um, I've tried not to jam pack it, so let's keep it informal. Feel free to interrupt with questions as we go along, okay? All right, so um, the Penn Center for Community Health Workers. Um, our mission is to improve health in high-risk populations through the effective use of CHWs. Key words, uh, we take a population-based approach and target lower income communities that are at a high risk of poor health outcomes across the board. What does that mean? It basically means that this is a map of disparities. Um, we all kind of know, and I think I'm preaching to the choir, that zip code is the most important risk factor for a variety of health outcomes, whether it's chronic disease, hospital admission, access to care. So at a certain point, it almost doesn't matter which outcome you're mapping or looking at. Um, income and zip code is the most important thing. So we take a, a, a population-based approach and target low-income communities. Um, and the care is delivered by people from within those communities. Community health workers are defined as lay people who share life experience with the patients whom they serve. And as I'll talk about a little bit later, they're also described in the sociology literature as natural helpers. They're the kind of person who is going to bring soup to a sick neighbor whether they're asked to or not. So that's the second uh, principle of our mission. And then the final principle is that we use science to understand and improve our outcomes so that we're delivering the most effective care possible. That's our mission, um, and we serve this mission through three sets of activities. First is research. We use a variety of research methods, and I'll talk a little bit more about that during this talk, um, all the way from qualitative interviews to pragmatic randomized control trials to design, test, and refine a scalable patient-centered community health worker model called IMPACT. Um, and even though our work grew from and continues to uh, grow from research, we're now fully funded by Penn Medicine operational dollars to deliver impact to 1,500 patients a year annually as part of routine care operations. So I know that will definitely come up um, as a question, and we'll talk about the process from growing from uh, community-engaged research to a sustainably funded uh, routine care model. And then finally, you know, I think we realized early on that we're by no means the only community or healthcare organization or academic medical system that's dealing with these issues, right? There's hot spots all across the country. And so we really wanted to um, take a leadership role in terms of shaping community health worker programs as they unfold across the country, sharing our learnings. Um, and so we have an open source toolkit, which I'll show you, um, and we also do training and technical assistance. And at this point, um, we've um, about 450 organizations across the country and some internationally have begun using our uh, materials and our offerings. So that's kind of who we are. Um, and I just want to talk about how we got here because I know in the audience there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be building their own programs and really um, doing important public and population health work. 
And so it might be um, useful to just kind of hear the narrative of, of how this um, uh, came to be so far. So I'll start with the design and how we uh, thought about designing our program. So the first thing I think that was a really important step was that we recognize that this is, we're not, we don't want to reinvent this wheel. Um, community health workers are not a new concept. They've been around since the 1800s, where they were first developed actually in Russia, um, the Russian Belcher movement is what it was called. And then it became larger scale in the 1920s when China established its Barefoot Doctor Program. How many of y'all have heard about the Barefoot Doctor Program? Okay. So that's the, you know, the largest, uh, the first large scale community health worker program. And then between the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, community health worker programs just began to catch a hold of countries all across the world, including the United States. And there were three key drivers um, that fueled this increased interest. Number one, a lot of the epidemics of the time, you know, tuberculosis, cholera, et cetera, were hardest hitting in low income populations. Number two, a lot of those epidemics were driven by factors that occurred outside of the hospital and clinic walls, whether it was overcrowding or you know, sanitation. Um, and then number three, taking care of these epidemics in the modern traditional healthcare system was literally bankrupting entire countries. Do those circumstances sound familiar? Yeah? yeah? What, what, what do they remind you of? Yeah, this is chronic disease in America today. Um, so it was an interesting parallel in the 20s through the 60s um, that community health workers who, again, came from within these low-income, high-risk communities who were really good at working outside of the walls and addressing the social and socioeconomic determinants and who could do so potentially more cost-effectively um, were a really hot concept. So by the 70s, the World Health Organization, um, right before this primary health conference in Alma-Ada, in a place called Alma-Ada, they issued this bulletin that basically was like, community health workers are the magic bullet. Um, you know, they, are, they can uh, address local concerns, they know things better than anybody else, and they can do so cost effectively. So again, um, if you read um, a lot of policy journals or even a newspaper, it seems like history is repeating itself. So that was 1974. What do you think happened by the 1980s? Anybody knows? Hmm? So globally, um, thinking globally, so there's this hot, you know, um, opportunity moment for community health worker programs. They're sprouting up in a lot of countries across the world. The hype is tremendous. Everybody thinks this is a magic bullet. Um, you can tell by the way I'm telling this story that I'm leading up to something. So by the 1980s, many of these programs failed. Okay, um, And it was really tragic um, to someone who believes in the potential of this concept um, to read about through the 80s and 90s a lot of community health worker programs closing their doors, being terminated. Um, and luckily, there were implementation scientists in the 80s and 90s who asked the question, why? And in fact, the title of this talk, From Rhetoric to Reality, was actually from one of these um, old 1980s papers where one of the scientists questioned, why is there such a gap between rhetoric and reality? This concept makes fundamental sense. Why are these programs closing their doors? So there were these scientists who studied, well, how come some pro most programs failed, but a couple didn't fail and they were successful? And it turned out that, yes, there were these large-scale policy things like global debt crises or you know, um, financial uh, structural adjustment. But more than that, actually, it was these implementation problems that separated the successful community health worker programs from the failing community health worker program. There were things that were the nuts and bolts of how community health worker programs were designed and run and scaled that made the difference between success and failure. You guys want to hear what those things were? Okay, because again, history is repeating itself, right? So we're in this moment in the United States where if you read the policies, uh, CMS has really heavily invested in accelerating growth of the community health worker workforce. There's a dozen different policies that I can rattle off that make it seem like this is going to happen again. And so we need to know what historic lessons we can learn so we don't make those mistakes. 
So it, it actually boiled down to <clears throat> five key factors that separated the successes and the failures. The number one thing was hiring, okay? So this is fundamentally a community health worker, regardless of you know, the details of the program and the model, uh, it's a human intervention, right? So it's really as good as the humans who are delivering the interventions, who are delivering the care. And it's something that depends really heavily on a community health worker's personality traits and interpersonal skills because the key ingredient is engaging high-risk patients and establishing trusting relationships. So what was interesting is despite that, I think everybody can kind of agree on that, um, most, there was a meta-analysis that showed that most community health worker programs didn't have a formal hiring process or an application process. And when they did have any application, they were weighing things like what's the paper application say, and you know, educational credentials or certification. And those things are not as relevant to this type of work. It's about interpersonal skills and personality traits. So as a result, one of the biggest problems in the 80s, 90s, you know, when community health worker programs failed was turnover and variability in performance from one community health worker to another. And as a result, the cost of these programs was actually much higher than people had anticipated because you keep having to rehire, retrain, and that's a tremendous strain on any organization. So number one was hiring. Number two was work practice. A lot of uh, the failing community health worker programs didn't clearly delineate um, what community health workers were supposed to be doing. Instead, it was, okay, let's hire these people, let's put them through a training, and then I'm going to give them a list of patients, and they're supposed to solve this. Um, well, what about, you know, where are they meeting these patients? What's their general model of how they're approaching these patients? What are they saying? Um, what's their caseload? Who's supervising them? Where are they documenting? What about safety protocols for community health workers out there? How do they, so there are all of these questions, not just about what do community health workers do, but program level infrastructure. And they were not written down anywhere, and in some cases they just weren't even discussed. So the programs that failed didn't have clear work practice manuals for community health workers or for um, infrastructure. And as a result, a lot of them didn't make good decisions on these critical infrastructural elements. And if they did, and but they didn't write it down, like they couldn't scale it properly because they didn't really know what they had done in the first place. So work practice. Um, number three, integration with clinical teams. So community health workers, it's a grassroots, community-based concept, and that is incredibly valuable. But at the same time, it turned out that a lot of the programs that failed and ultimately had to close their doors were purely community-based and not plugged in at all to what was going on within formal healthcare systems, the doctor's office, the nurses, the you know, hospital floors. And that created a couple problems. Number one, they couldn't coordinate and give patients the best care in real time. You know, so if a community health worker found out that a patient was medically ill and had a medical issue, they couldn't call the doctor and get the person the right care, and vice versa. So it was a problem for the actual care of patients. But also, um, because the clinical systems didn't know what was happening with the community health worker program, they didn't value them. So they didn't feel compelled to pay for them in the end. Um, and so that left these programs dependent on grant funding, which we all know will dry up, and then the program will have to close its doors. Um, finally, I'm oh, sorry, one more thing was um, the successful programs versus the unsuccessful programs had a different approach to what the role of the community health worker was. Um, a lot of programs that ultimately ran into trouble had community health workers doing disease education or even basic health care things like triaging. Um, complaints. Now, that may make sense in you know, the barefoot doctor model in rural China, but in more developed countries, that led to liability issues and turf struggles with clinicians who were thinking, well, that's a clinician's role. Um, and it seemed to work better when the community health workers were focusing on upstream factors, things like trauma or food insecurity or housing, that really kind of affected a range of different diseases. Um, so that they weren't getting into these clinical um, territories. And they were, in fact, more powerful because they were able to intervene upstream on things that could scale whether you were dealing with a patient with diabetes or hypertension or congestive heart failure. Does that make sense? Okay. And then the, the final piece is 
the, the programs that endure had a more rigorous evidence base supporting their effectiveness. Um, it's funny because I, I, I hear so much um, kind of variation in response to this concept of, you know, we need to have an evidence base for community health worker programs. And I think a lot of people say one of two things. Number one, this is such, this is such a no-brainer. Do we really need to prove that this is going to be a beneficial thing? Um, and it turns out that you do, because these are really hard needles that we're, you know, trying to move. You know, changing population health is incredibly hard work. There have been generations of people who have been trying to do this, and it's hard. Um, it's hard to, you know, at the individual level, get someone to quit smoking when they've grown up in poverty and trauma. It's a hard thing to do. It's hard to, you know, change utilization patterns. So, so it, it, it does require evidence to, to say that something is effective. Um, and the other thing that I will often hear is, well, there's been data that show that community health worker programs are effective. Why do we keep needing to, you know, um, do studies? The concept of community health workers is so broad that saying community health workers are effective is kind of like saying pills are effective, right? Some pills are, some pills aren't. You got to figure out what the right um, delivery system is, and then develop an evidence base. For that and scale it. So I think that's kind of um, the way I would um, discuss that. So going back to the 80s and the global health implementation science literature, the programs that were able to convince funders that they needed to stick around were the ones that had high quality evidence. Um, the problem that I think we see, uh, we saw then and even still to this day see now, and it really contributed to the decline in the 90s, was that there was a lot of low quality evidence, so pre-post studies or um, that were really kind of taking credit for the regression to the mean. Is that a concept that you guys have learned yet? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. That's good. <laughs> um, so, you know, so that was, um, that was a problem, and it, and it led to two types of things. Funders would either, number one, just disregard all of it. You know, they'd say, this is soft science. I don't, I don't believe any of this data. That was one type of problem. The other kind of problem was that funders were overly optimistic about what kinds of outcomes these types of programs could achieve. So they're like, anytime you have a community health worker involved, readmissions are going to be reduced by 60%. And that's not true. So then when you go to actually invest in these programs, they were disappointments early on, which is why you know the hype of the 70s and then the awakening of the, of the 80s. So these were the five key lessons um, that we learned from the implementation scientists of the 80s. So we, you know, back in 2010, um, moving back to our story here in Philadelphia, um, when we were first thinking about designing uh, a community health worker, or an actual a program, we didn't even know there was going to be a community health worker program, we wanted to learn from history, but we really also wanted to learn from our patients. And so, just to set the stage, you know, it was 2010, the Affordable Care Act had actually just gone through the Supreme Court for the first of end times, and it was looking to be a reality. And healthcare organizations like Penn Medicine, like, you know, Hahnemann or Temple or all of these, you know, places nationally, were starting to be held accountable for the same outcomes that were mapping, we were mapping in red. So, chronic disease, hospital admissions, access to care, these were now starting to become financially um, impactful to healthcare organizations. So they were interested in moving the needle on that. So we um, began engaging with Penn Medicine stakeholders really early on, but we also wanted to talk to the patients themselves who were being affected. So um, I met a woman named Tamara Carter who uh, is from the Southwest Philadelphia community, um, and she became a co-investigator and still is on hundreds of in-depth qualitative interviews where we went to people's porches and hospital bedsides and talked to people who live in this hotspot and asked them, what makes it hard for you to stay healthy and what should we be doing differently? Um, so a lot of key themes came out of those interviews, but really clearly one of them was that there was a huge sense of disconnect from traditional healthcare personnel. Um, people like doctors, nurses, social workers, even case managers or care coordinators, people who had had a different lived experience. And patients wished for support from someone to whom they could relate, and they wished for support for the issues that were really driving their healthcare outcomes. Oh, question. Just a quick question. Um, sure. How much is the, the agency factor important in a community health center, uh, community health workers uh, work in terms of if I'm a community health worker from Penn and I go to a home 
and there's a person there who's not a Penn patient, do I do, do I just ignore that particular person within the community agency where I'm from the community? My responsibility is to that community. What is the um, the relationship there? Um, let me come back to that when I talk a little bit more about the model and you know who who we're working with. Okay, um, but in, um, that's a, a fantastic question, and we'll, we'll we'll get to that. Remind me if I forget when we get to that point. Um, so so before we even start designing, you know, the, the actual program, we're just going to think about how we designed it. So talking to, to people, heard that key theme. Um, and there were a couple of other key themes, and here's what we did, and I think this was pretty important looking back. We went through this very granular process of design mapping, right? So we took these hundreds of qualitative, um, in-depth interviews, which, you know, I know a lot of you are doing scholarly pursuits and research. This is a fantastic um, way to start. We took the qualitative interviews, we coded them, and we made a list of all of the different barriers that our patients were describing. So there was about 30 barriers, and you know, for each of these barriers, we said, okay, what intervention step would address that problem? So a lot of patients, the moment they entered the healthcare system, they said, no one's listening to me, and they're looking down on me. And they wanted to be heard and didn't want to be judged. So the intervention step would be that a community health worker, at the point of meeting the patient, would conduct an open-ended, strengths-based interview, not a checklist that looks like this where they're not listening. Um, and then we went two steps further. We said, what traits would somebody need to have in order to do that step? And what skills could we train them on to do that step even better? So we went row by row for all of the 30 barriers. And by the end, we had this you know, four page long design map. The intervention column became the basis for our work practice manual. So this became the meat of what community health workers actually do. The traits column became the basis of the hiring protocols, right? Remember, looking back to the historical lessons, hiring is the number one thing. We now had this long list of what traits we were looking for. And the skills column became the basis of our month-long college accredited training curriculum. But you know, the, the training really is an overlay to hiring people that have these traits. Does that make sense? So in that way, we were able to not only map the intervention, but the workforce and training requirements back to the problems that we were trying to solve, that patients were telling us about. So now let me talk a little bit about what the impact model actually looks like. Um, and I'll try to reflect back to those historic lessons um, as I do so. So first of all, who are the community health workers that we hire? So we look for people who have the traits on that design map in the traits column. And we also have these um, processes that we've developed to identify those people. And just to give you a sense of them, so for, for example, we don't post the community health worker job publicly in the newspaper. We circulate it um, through a targeted circulation to community organizations where these natural helpers are likely to already be integrated into. So block captains associations, YMCAs, um, police academies, churches, um, that's how we get the recruitment word out. Once we do that recruitment blast, we then really deprioritize the paper application. We're not, you know, we're looking for it to be, you know, it's a one-page application. Is it complete? Is it sloppy? Other than that, we're not paying a whole lot of attention to the credentials on that application. In fact, we're really looking for people who are demographic mirrors of our patient population. So the only minimum requirement is high school. And in fact, that's kind of what we're looking for. Beyond that, we have a series of strategies that helps us to assess interpersonal skills. We have meet and greets so that we can bring, you know, 12 to 15 people in at a time and, you know, basically get a sense of their interpersonal skills and what they're like to interact with. Um, we then have structured interviews, two rounds of interviews, which is kind of intense, and we do um, case-based scenarios with applicants to give them role plays and see how they would react in the situation. And then we also call their employers for references for traits that we can't assess in person, things like organizational reliability. So we have a really intense hiring process, but over the past um, five years, and we now have 44 full-time employees, we've not had any turnover, which is pretty exciting. Um, so then um, here's what the actual work practice looks like from the standpoint of the patient and the community health worker. And I'll reflect back to, you'll see how this is non, it's disease agnostic and it's actually setting agnostic too. It can work whether it's inpatient, outpatient, whatever disease the patient has. 
And here's what happens. So community health workers will meet with patients in the healthcare setting. So they do enroll patients when either they're hospitalized or on the day of an appointment. And, they, um, and there's reasons for that. But, but the reasons are actually in our qualitative interviews. Patients didn't feel comfortable opening the door to a stranger, and so they wanted to make that connection in a safe space. It doesn't, it, you know, ultimately doesn't have to be a healthcare environment. We're now scaling this and thinking about future use cases where they meet in a prison um, for a reentry type of uh, version of this, or you know, other settings. But it, it kind of needed to be a safe space for patients, so that they knew they weren't opening the door to like DHS or a crazy person. Um, so, so they meet in the healthcare setting and they do that open-ended, strengths-based qualitative interview that we um, mapped out in our design map. And the key question there in that interview is, Mr. Jones, what do you think you need in order to improve your health? How many of you have ever been asked that question by a healthcare provider? I, and I never asked that question as a physician in my practice until we came up with it in the plot. And it's embarrassing because you're always dictating to patients what you think they need. You never ask them. So the beauty of this question is that Mr. Jones can say, hey, for me, I really need to find stable housing and I need diabetic test strips. And Mrs. Smith can say, my son was murdered a month ago and I cannot get out of bed and I need to find purpose in life. Um, it, of course, it doesn't come out like that. It's a two-hour long conversation. But by the end of the conversation, each patient chooses their own adventure for the intervention. They set their own goals. And the community health worker helps them to create these action plans towards reaching those goals. What are the advantages of that approach? Science? Yeah, number one, psychologically, this is 100% aligned with goal setting theory. People do better if they're collaboratively setting goals, if they're setting goals that are realistic, meaningful for them, and that aren't creating conflict with other goals that they already have. Mr. Jones, you need to take your Lasix, and he's thinking, well, I need to keep my job as a bus driver, and I can't stop to urinate every 30 minutes. So, you know, goal conflict um, and all of those other domains is much, much less when the patient's coming up with the goals um, themselves. So, buy-in for short. What else, though? That's not the only one. Flexible and then personalized and probably more effective. Okay, that's good. But I would say I would argue flesh that out a little bit more for me. How's that different from is that different from buying or what are the actual advantages to it? Well, I mean the intervention can be tailored to somebody's unique circumstances and needs as opposed to having a one size fits all intervention that's predetermined. Good, you're getting there. So why is that why is that good though? Because people have different needs and they're are different places and have different health needs and different issues that need to be addressed um, to, to achieve those longer term health outcomes. Right, there you go. Okay, so number one, you're solving the actual problems that the person has, but I'll, I'll say one other thing. Um, it's cheaper to do it that way, right? Because other programs, you know, for example, these care team models where every person gets the you know, doctor, nurse, pharmacist, social worker intake, not everybody has problems with pharmacy and they might not need that cookie cutter approach. So there's a lot of efficiencies in the resource allocation when you have the community health worker be the quarterback who's kind of in the line of sight of the patient and helps to set the agenda and then connects them with what resources they actually need. So that's, that's, that's in that first stage. They're setting goals and they're creating these action plans. The second stage is they're providing instrumental and emotional support. They really um, focus on hands-on support rather than informational support. You know, they're not giving out just numbers and pamphlets. They're going with their patients to work out at the YMCA, or they're going with them to addiction services. They're going with them to the grocery store, and they really are trying to come up with these creative you know, action plans in step one that they're executing in step two. So a lot of these, you know, for Mrs. Smith who needs to find purpose in her life, they're going with her to a crochet club in her community or a senior center or, a, you know, we've had community health workers go to, like, motorcycle club meetings with their patients just to find that purpose in life again. And then ultimately, they're connecting them with a source of long-term support when the intervention ends, whether it's um, stable primary care or a support group that the community health workers themselves facilitate. So that's essentially what the model looks like from the standpoint of community health worker and patient. Any questions about that? 
That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and it was a real question um, in our minds about whether we would be able to recruit the level of that, uh, you know, of people that we were looking for based on our traits column. Like, how many of these people exist? It seemed like a real kind of um, unicorn person that we were looking for for a while. It has really, um, you know, not to get too corny, but it's given me a lot of faith in the good of people. There are good people out there. Um, and we had, you know, 15 applications for every slot. And um, it's ultimately, um, we've scaled pretty rapidly. So we've gone from, in the last year and a half, six to 44 full-time employees. And the quality of our outcomes has not suffered. And we track them, as I'll tell you, incredibly carefully. And there's not been those variations from one person to another. Um, so it's really interesting to see that there's people who want to do that. The other part of your question was, it is a broad, there's a breadth here. Because when you're doing these tailored, flexible interventions, um, you have to be prepared to work across a lot of different domains. They're not just doing a narrow patient navigation intervention. They're not just doing health coaching. They're not just doing social support. It's kind of what needs to be done. But um, as I'll get to in a minute, we have built in a lot of structure where we can build in structure. And then there's soft parts where there's flexibility. So they feel, I think, supported because of the structures that I'll, I'll talk about. Um, and I think for a lot, we're hiring people who've been kind of doing this anyway all of their lives and natural helpers. Um, so we're mainly looking for traits like ingenuity, you know, perseverance, um, empathy. They don't have to know all the answers, and I'll tell you they have a lot of supports, but they just need to be the type of people that will keep going until they get it done. It sounds like you do a lot of work on the front end uh, with your employees, but what about on the tail end uh, managing issues such as burnout? Great, great, perfect segue. Okay, so, um, so we talked about what it looks like from the community health worker perspective, but remember, historically, that is not all that matters. In fact, that pales, I think, in significance to the program level supports that guard against burnout and safety violations and you know, people doing things that they're not supposed to be doing. So we've been really careful to build not just the community health worker stuff, but the program infrastructure. Um, so how does that work? So the first important concept is that community health workers are on teams. Even if there's, um, so there's about four to six community health workers on any given team. Those community health workers can be at different clinics. They can even be, you know, at hospitals versus clinic sites, and they can be spread across the entire healthcare system and even the city. Now we're at the VA and federally qualified health centers in West Philly, and you can still have people come together and be part of a team. Um, the team comes together every week, they have ongoing training, they debrief, and that camaraderie is absolutely essential. Each team is managed by a manager, and that is a central person who is typically a social worker or an equivalent, and that role I cannot overstate. That person is the real-time supervisor and support person for, the community, for their team of community health workers so that you know, if Mary's a community health worker and she's out in the field and her patient's suicidal, she's immediately calling, you know, um, Daenerys, who's her manager. And that person has her back and kind of walks her through what to do. That is a big source of burnout in these historical um, programs that have failed, is that they're flapping the breeze and they have no infrastructure. So the manager provides that. They also, the manager meets with each community health worker once a week to run the list, which is to review all of their caseload and to kind of troubleshoot, you know, who's doing well, who's not doing so well. The manager uses, we have this um, cloud-based platform that we've developed for community health worker documentation that also generates these reports that are incredibly useful that we use to see, well, how are community health workers doing and are they actually helping patients reach the goals that they're setting? Um, and how about traditional metrics like hemoglobin A1C or hospitalizations? How are they doing with that? So the managers um, track that um, performance across a lot of domains, um, and they're able to use that to um, assess and improve community health worker performance. And finally, the managers are the people that plug the community health workers into the clinical practices and inpatient teams. A lot of these teams have never worked with community health workers before, and they don't really know how to support that role. One of the classic mistakes or you know, uh, pitfalls that occurred historically with community health worker programs and continue to see is 
okay, a clinic will hire a community health worker, and they'll basically have, you know, one of the nurses who already works in that clinic be a part-time supervisor for the community health worker. Well, that nurse may not be ideally suited to be the supervisor for a community health worker. She may not have had experience with that role or the traits or pro proclivity for that, and she doesn't have, you know, the full-time bandwidth to support that community health worker, and so they end up um, sometimes in trouble. Zip code concordance with the patient, race concordance with the patient, gender, are those the criteria? Mm -hmm. So when we hire, we do look generally for um, demographic concordance. Um, we look also at those traits, so it's both. You have to kind of have a demographic con concordance across the dimensions that you listed, um, and then the traits. When we enroll patients, though, we don't match by community health worker traits, and here's why. Um, we you can either have community health workers working with the set practice location. For example, Mary is the community health worker for the 3701 Market Street Clinic, or you can match by patient concordance. You can't do both operationally. Does that make sense? Um, because if a patient comes into 3701 Market, you either have to have that community health worker who works there or across the whole healthcare system be able to match. And at this point, we thought it was valuable for the community health worker to form relationships with a, a practice environment. Um, the other reason is that we don't know exactly what are the key variables to match on yet, and we're doing some research, because it's very interesting. It may not just be race and gender, it may be personality traits, um, and so we're developing some um, ideas and research on that, and if that becomes really convincing, we might switch gears. Um, okay, so. So the team structure, the, the manager role is crucial. Just like, how many patients are typically on a caseload? Yeah, great question. Um, and that kind of segues me to my next part of the program standardization is that we've written manuals for basically each role in the impact model. And, and this is, I can't state how important this is. So there's a manual for the manager, there's manuals for the community health workers, there's even a manual for someone who wants to be the director of an impact program in their institution or location, which goes over things like hiring, creating a budget, you know, pitching this to your health system leadership, generating evidence. Um, you can't learn everything by doing reading a manual, which is why we offer training in TA, but it's there. Um, so within those manuals are things like caseloads. So uh, the way that we developed our caseloads is we start with what problem are you trying to solve? Um, and how long is that going to take? And then what's the optimal you know, caseload for that? So in the overall impact model, we've iterated, remember I said it's disease and setting agnostic, we've developed these variations of it for the hospital setting, for people who are transitioning from hospital to primary care, in the outpatient setting, you know, um, where we're really trying to improve chronic disease outcomes in high-risk pregnant women. In each of those use cases, we're trying to solve a different problem. So for the transitions um, problem, the, uh, uh, program, the thing that we're trying to prevent is people slipping through the cracks um, and not basically getting to their discharge medications, able to follow their discharge instructions, or ever making it to primary care. That's a pretty focused problem, and so we developed a two to four week intervention to prevent those problems. And so then we piloted it and realized that, okay, a two week intervention at any given time, a community health worker might have you know, 12 patients. Over the course of the year, their caseload is about 90. In the outpatient setting, we're trying to change hemoglobin A1Cs or get people to quit smoking um, or lose weight or control their blood pressure. How long do you think that would take? Yeah, at least. So we're trying it in a six-month intervention. Um, it probably takes like 20 years, but you know, we're, we're, we're trying to see if we can see any effect size in a six-month intervention. So you know, similarly, we said, okay, six-month intervention, you know, on, on average, you can probably have 25 patients at a given time or 30 patients at a time after our piloting. So over the course of a year, the caseload is about 50 to 60. So for each you know, iteration of this underlying program, we say, okay, what problems are we trying to solve? What's the duration? And then pilot it with that duration and, and get back to the average caseload. And that's all kind of listed in these manuals. Um, so that's kind of, I, I can't emphasize enough this program infrastructure. These manuals also go over things like safety protocols. 
which I don't think we talk about enough. I mean, these patients are putting them, I mean, the community health workers are putting themselves at risk. They're, you know, going into high-risk communities, fine, but they're also deeply involved with their patients' lives, and you can have problems when that, um, uh, with that level of intimacy. And unless you're c committing to the community health workers in your program and saying, we have policies for your safety. So all of our community health workers, when they go on home visits, they go with a buddy. They do not go into a home alone. When they go on, on a home visit, they text into their manager. The manager also has GPS enabled their phone so they can track them. And if they don't text out, they will notify the police and they've had to do a check of wellness. So, you know, it's, it's, it's our responsibility when we're asking people to do this kind of work to take care of them. Um, okay, so that's that. And then remember the, the other historic lesson was have these programs stay grassroots but somehow plug in to be integrated with what clinicians are doing. Um, so community health workers are um, integrated with the Penn Medicine teams. And as I mentioned, we're also at the VA and at these community health centers. And they communicate through the um, electronic medical record, through the telephone, and then when the huddles exist within the a clinical environment, they, they go to huddles. The biggest problem is that a lot of teams just don't do huddles, and so we don't try to invent a practice environment that's ideal for community health workers. We work with what they have. Um, but the bare minimum is EMR and telephone communication. We've also worked with the um, School of Medicine over at Penn to develop something that I think is really neat and probably is relevant, so I'll spend a second talking about it. It's called the Impact Teaching Service, and it's a medical student rotation where the students are apprenticed to the community health worker for a month, and they learn from the community health worker about basically how to be a community health worker, how to um, understand and address the social determinants of health. Um, the reason that we developed this was that there are a lot of service learning programs, you know, that's kind of the, the model for students to learn about community engagement, and that's fantastic. People who are experts in service learning, though, have identified a couple of limitations with traditional service learning programs. So when I say service learning, what, do you, what kinds of programs do you guys think about? Community service. Yeah, like, like what? Yeah, like a homeless health clinic, you know, school cleanup, that kind of thing. So the limits, what, what are some of the limitations with that approach? I'll, I'll, I'll flip it back to you guys. Volunteer-based. Mm -hmm. Why is that a problem? It could, like, I, I thought of AmeriCorps Vista programs, and it sometimes it can be hard to recruit because of the incentive, like they don't get paid very much, they're working long hours, um, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Who said that? Yes. Sorry. Say more. What do you mean by that? Um, so volunteering organizations uh, typically, like you said, it's rapid turnover, so people are coming in and out to do a job that people um, are interested in, but they're not invested in staying there because it's, it's not a job that's volunteered, so it's not consistent. Exactly. You guys got it. So student service learning programs have been plagued by high turnover. Y'all are busy, you go from one thing to the next, and as your priorities change, students will often, unfortunately, have to leave patients and their community partners behind. Um, and in the service learning literature, um, critics have called this the community safari. You know, you're going through and you're turning over rapidly, and it's more helpful to the students than it is to the community. Um, what's another problem with the traditional service learning model? This is a slightly, guess what I'm thinking, tougher one, but take a stab at it. Any other things that bug you about these models? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. I would put this under the umbrella of, you know, a rapidly transient turning over workforce. How about the linkage to care? Like, because it's so kind of floating, yeah. it would be hard to link people within those settings if needed to other parts of care that they might need. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I, put, I would still put that under this, you know, the rapidly turning over. There's a whole other conceptual domain that's a problem. There's a lack of community engagement still. You're getting there. What's that mean? Just because you're working in a service environment, it doesn't mean that you're engaging with the community or learning from the community. You might be, but you're, you're 
so you're, you're getting closer enough, and I'm just going to tell you what I'm thinking, which is that there's this power dynamic, right, that exists between students and community members, and these programs don't do much to reverse them. In fact, they can reinforce, you know, the provision of charity care through homeless health clinics. Like, I'm a student feeling good about myself, and I'm volunteering in this homeless health clinic, giving charity care to community members. So it's not, it's reinforcing, and at least it's not disrupting traditional power dynamics, and it's not creating community capacity. A student doing this work is a job that's not actually being given, a paid job maybe, to a community member. So those are the criticisms of service learning in the literature, and so that's why the School of Medicine, and I'll credit them, came to us um, when we were building the center and said, you know, we have these service learning programs, but we have these limitations. Can we think of something to address them? And so I think the hallmarks of the teaching service are that, number one, the community health workers are the permanents. You know, they're paid full-time employees of Penn Medicine. They're going to be there with their patients when the student turns over to their next rotation. And number two, they are in charge of the student for the month. They are um, your evaluator, your teacher. They're giving you a grade. And so it does flip that traditional power dynamic. Um, any other questions or comments about that? What is the benefit of flipping the power dynamic? You tell me. <laughs> you know how I work out. Well, I, asked it. <laughs> uh, I guess the, the benefit of flipping the power dynamic, I guess, would be a benefit to the student as opposed to the community because then they're having to answer to someone that they wouldn't a lot of times have to answer to in the community. Colleagues had reactions. I mean, I think that's a good. So I think your point about students. I think I think you know. So we've been doing this now for a couple of years, and I'll tell you that students do feel a sense of relief, actually, uh, um, for in not having to be the superior person in that relationship because they recognize that they're not anyway. But in these traditional systems, they they were kind of put into that role, so they're happier acknowledging that they don't understand this domain and they're the learner in that environment. So it does benefit them. How do people think it might benefit the community members? You mentioned earlier capacity building, so building the community's capacity to engage in care. Um, and I think also, when you were going back to the very beginning, you were talking about when you're interviewing folks coming in, what do you want in your care? It kind of puts the control and the power um, in the community. Yeah. And I think we're overthinking this. I mean, community members are the experts in their problems and solutions. So it's annoying when a student comes in and is in the role of an expert when they're not. You know? So I mean, Mrs. Jones, who's grown up and lived in West and Southwest and has been helping her neighbors all her life deal with food insecurity, transportation, trauma, all of those kinds of issues, like she's the expert. So Shreya, the little med student coming in, is not. And it's dumb, and like, I act like I am. So it's a relief to both parties. So um, here's some quotes just to kind of reflect that, remember, the two benefits of having integration are that, number one, it's probably better for care, but number two, it builds, it gets buy-in from the clinical teams, the formal healthcare system in the concept of community health workers. So here's a couple of illustrative quotes. Um, this one's from a nurse on one of our um, Presbyterian medical, general medical floors. Um, she was talking about a community health worker, Cheryl, I'll say her name, Complement is symbolic of the highest standards of patient advocacy and the best our health system offers its patients. Do you see how there's ownership there? You know, the, our health system, this community health worker, is part of our health system. Um, and the subtext is, and we're willing to pay for it. Um, this, a student on the teaching service, I was just so grateful that people did this work. And I was glad to learn how to do it better to establish this patient dynamic. Um, okay. So then there's that final historic lesson, which is high quality evidence. And I'll just um, say that we, when we first started doing um, the impact uh, program in 2010, we developed it. And then by 2011, we were uh, uh, running the impact transitions program, which is that two to four week dose for hospitalized patients. And we did a randomized control trial of about 450 patients and showed that it improved a variety of post-hospital outcomes, including increasing access to primary care, including um, increasing HCAP scores, which are a pay for performance quality measure, um, modest reductions in readmission, and improvements in activation and mental health. 
We have a couple of other RCTs ongoing. One is a single center RCT um, looking at the six month impact primary care program. And there we're looking to see, hey, does it actually move any long chronic disease outcomes? And um, now we're, as I mentioned, we're also doing a PCORI at a, a, a several different sites looking to see does it work in these different care environments. Um, a word about how to translate this into sustainable financing. So each of the outcomes that we measure in our trials are things that are problems for health system stakeholders, and in fact, problems that they're willing to pay for if somebody solves them, and they're also problems for community members. So finding this lose-lose actually is a crucial first step in building any sustainable community-based intervention. You have to figure out not only what's benefiting or what are problems for the low resource community, but what's a high resource stakeholder that's losing money on those same outcomes. Get them both to the table at the very beginning, define what are your shared problems and what would success look like, like how, what actual metrics would, would be measured if you wanted to track success in solving this problem. And then you try to solve the problem rigorously and demonstrate that in a randomized control trial. Um, and you line, you've already lined up who's willing to pay for it. So then it's just a matter of circling back to those same people and saying, hey, remember back in 2010 we talked about how this was a problem for you guys? Look, we have an RCT showing that we're able to move the needle on it. Um, can you pay it for it now? And that's essentially what happened. I think people are always pretty flabbergasted that Penn Medicine's paying, you know, two and a half million dollars a year for this program. And I do think that they have been enlightened partners to work with, but I also think that there's something to this process of getting them to the table early, figuring out what the lose-loses are, and then demonstrating movement on those exact metrics. Um, so we've been able to demonstrate, um, you know, preventable hospitalizations clearly affect patients and the bottom line for Penn, um, patient satisfaction, that's a paper performance measure, the med school is paying for the teaching service, um, practices are interested in having care coordination, patient navigation being delivered by the best uh, workforce possible. Um, people who both understand these issues are and are not clinically trained um, and clinically paid. Um, and then we're doing this ongoing RCT to see whether we're able to improve chronic disease control, which as you guys know are fetus measures, which are another paper performance. So um, I'll stop there actually, and I just want to kind of take questions. If we have time, we can talk about future directions, but I want to give us enough time for more conversation, even though this has been lively. Good question. So, what's the compensation? Um, so, uh, at the entry level, community health workers make approximately fifteen to sixteen dollars an hour, um, and there's rapid promotion. Um, we have we're developing actually with community health workers career ladders, um, which, which is really it's part of our future directions. But there's um, there's compensation. It's, it's a full time job with full benefits. I think that um, that is a long. The, the lines of, if you look at national community health worker workforce surveys, we're not paying a whole lot higher or lower. Um, we got that number based on national um, patterns because we want to be fair. But I, I, so I think we're um, providing a good living wage, but it's also not something where that's the key factor in our retention. Um, there's something else that's keeping people there um, beyond just the pay. These trials that I mentioned are randomized at the patient level, and the way that we describe this when we're getting informed consent is, listen, this is the idea. You know, we're testing to see whether getting support from a community member will help with your X, Y, Z. But we're not sure if this is going to work. And I'll tell you that there are some interim data um, that suggest, you know, from this program and other programs, and sometimes it could be harmful. You know, so uh, for example, 
some patients actually react poorly, we're learning, to having somebody check in on them weekly. There are people who have a learning response to that, and then there's people who have an avoidance response, right? Who are like, stop calling me, and it's making me want to smoke even more. You <laughs> never know that if you didn't study it, but it's really, it's there, you know, it's interesting. So when we, when we get, do informed consent, we say, Mr. Jones, you know, here's the program, you have a 50-50 chance of getting a community health worker or getting standard support from your clinical team. We're doing this because we don't know whether this is effective yet, and we want to learn if it is or not. Um, so that's one way that I think I feel perfectly ethically comfortable because there's a lot of programs that don't work and they're just annoying or waste people's time. The other thing is people aren't getting this program anyway. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 from the standpoint of resource allocation, it, you're stuck in this kind of chicken egg cycle. Unless you prove that something is effective, you can't fund it to scale sustainably so that you're actually able to offer an effective program at the population level. Um, and so when you're in that stage where there isn't an existing program, there are people who are going to get it or not, so it's better to be fair about it and randomized. Okay, I think we may have addressed this, but just two related questions. Very impressive, but I guess the thing that struck me is it seems to depend on a lot of both labor resources and financial resources. Could you talk about um, sort of the replicability of sure. capital? Great question. Um, I'll start with replicability, and I'll probably pick a slide or two from the future direction. So, yes, we do have in mind replicability. You know, we, we I said that this was what our mission was, um, and we recently came up with our five-year plan, and we forced ourselves to say, what's it going to look like if we achieve this mission in 50, 100 years? Um, and this is what I think it looks like. So if you think about health, there's three dimensions. There's actual health outcomes like mortality or blood pressure. There's the patient's experience, things like access to care or you know, satisfaction, and then there's cost. Right now, the reality is that there are huge disparities in health in low versus high income communities. And we said to ourselves at our advisory board meeting that success in 100 years looks like this, that you know, there are no income differences in health across these three domains because community health workers are effectively improving the triple aim, improving health in low income communities. So this is a tall order, this is an aspirational goal, but the question is how do we get there? And these are some of the key questions, maybe I'll leave you with this, um, this slide, that we built into our five-year plan. You know, first of all, is this working? This is hard to do. Um, how can we continually improve the care model so that it's as effective as possible? helping people not have that avoidance reaction to their community health worker, for example. Um, quality often suffers with growth. How do we scale this without decreasing quality? So we're actually writing a manual right now about well, how did we go from six to 44 people and achieve the same outcomes? Because there's a, there is an answer to it, we think. Um, and it has to do not only with hiring, but how do we track information? What kind of information do we collect? And, how do we identify people who are um, doing well or not doing well and provide personalized coaching on that? Um, how can we bring this non-medical intervention into healthcare you know, without messing it up? Um, and then this is a key one to, to get to your point. There's an opportunity moment in the United States for healthcare programs. How can we make sure that what happened in the 1980s globally doesn't happen again, which is that, hey, there's all this hype and then the programs just fall apart. And so for that one in particular, we're really launching um, a pretty aggressive agenda for how do we support community health workers um, and how do we shape them across the country. And so we're going to be um, working on replication as a big part of that. Thank you so much. Thank you.